to the city of London. We are coming to you live for the 2023 Mid-Season Invitational. Copper Box Arena, let's make some noise! That's right, everyone, MSI is back. We have a new format this year. More teams, more players, which means more chances for history to be made. Today, we'll be kicking off the play-in stage, but in three weeks' time, a winner will be crowned in this very arena. Copper Box, are you guys ready for some League of Legends? Well, without further ado, let's get this show on the road. MSI 2023 starts right now. Everybody else, welcome to London. Welcome to MSI 2023. You can see PSG talent getting themselves ready, taking to the stage to open up the first best of series against Detonation Focus Me live from the Copper Box Arena. Thank you so much to Yinsu and everybody here in the arena. It's the middle of the day on a Tuesday, and we're here for some great League of Legends. I'm Quickshot, joined by Gulbog and Raz, and in this great venue, I think I'll call you Rocksteady and Bebop instead. How are you boys doing? Ready for MSI? Hey. Doing real damn well. <laughs> Very excited. Well, listen, the entirety of MSI is going to be played on patch 13.8. We don't have a lot of time before we get to the game. So I tasked Gilborg and Raz to present a couple of new champions, which they think we might see, which they might expect in the next few weeks. Raz, do you want to kick us off? What are you yes. expecting? I'll be a little bit boring because these are champions that we've already seen so far going into MSI. Specifically, we've seen On on Leona, and Leona has received a few buffs. Specifically, we've seen it to Eclipse, getting more uh, magic resistant armor, especially a little bit more damage. On top of that, it's a cl classic historic counter to Rakan, so I expect that. Galio, we've seen it from you, boy, so I'm expecting to see it more, more team fighting. And honestly, if we see those picks, makes it right for uh, counter picks and carry junglers. So Nidalee received a few buffs. We're already seeing Junja spam it in ch ch uh, solo queue. So those are the three champions that I expect to see. Yeah, and I do agree with them uh, in terms of the champions coming in. A lot of it's just like champions we have seen before that received a little extra yes. going into it. And that also leaves it with my one, which is Lilia, Orn, and Esriel. The Lilia one specifically, well, we've already seen Yike uh, perform on the champion back in winter spring or winter split of the LEC. And it was often used as a counter into some of these facilitated junglers, specifically the Sejuani. Now that it's got some buffs, if we see anyone go for some of these facilitator, still the same logic with the Nidalee, fast clear, something that's reliable. And that then that's going into the next one, Orn. Now Orn specifically, um, weirdly enough, did not receive any buffs. Uh, he did receive some buck fixes though. And okay. as soon as those came through, he went from 50% uh, win rate in solo queue into 53% in solo queue afterwards. So that's something to look out for. And then the boy, the Eshrel, we've seen eh, him so many. Really? Yeah, I know. Whatever. You don't like it, but it's not that I don't like up. it. It's not that I don't like it. It's just it is one of those picks along with Oriani. You always see international it's events, a classic. and it always kills the people. Me love it because uh, the Eastern bot <laughs> love it. Kick uh. the crap out of us. So obviously seeing LCK and LPL like doing generally speaking better on the champion. So I'm intrigued to see what will happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least we had Cassie on the Estrel as well, but that's something that, True. you know, where th this is a champion that receives some minor buffs. It's not that something that's groundbreaking. He's suddenly going to be 100% pick ban all the time, but it's good for the play style you mentioned too. The one where it's like, all right, here's some facilitators. We want to let them out on the map. And Estrel allows that while also being a carry. I'm really, really hopeful that we get some surprise picks and some uh, different interpretations on the patch. We'll find out today and tomorrow as we see two groups battling. Now that you know what champions to expect on the Rift, it's time to find out how we'll find out the champion of MSI 2023. So to start off and to remind everybody of the new format, check this out with Vedius. Oh, 
will not go quietly into the night. It's MSI and J2 are back. MSI 2023 is heading to London with a brand new format, where 13 teams will compete across two rounds of double elimination battles. This is their first step towards greatness, a chance to push beyond their own limits and defy global expectations. Here's everything you need to know. This year, MSI is expanding to include more teams with 13 in total. LCK, LPL, LEC, and LCS will send two teams, while LLA, CBLOL, PCS, VCS, and LDL will send one team. MSI's new competitive format will feature two double elimination stages, play-ins and bracket stage. It's RNG's world, and we're just living in it. Play-ins will kick off with the second seed from LPL, LEC, and LCS, as well as the top seeds from LLA, CBLOL, PCS, VCS, and the LGL being drawn into two best-of-three double elimination brackets. The winners of each bracket will advance directly to the next stage, while the second place teams will battle it out in a last chance qualification match for the final bracket stage spot. Those three teams will join the remaining five competitors, who are the top seeded teams from the LPL, LEC, LCS, as well as the top two teams from the LCK, and will then be drawn into four matches to kick off a best of five double elimination bracket, culminating in the grand final on May 21st to determine the MSI 2023 champion title. You can watch all the action May 2nd to the 21st on lolesports.com and be sure to log in to collect drops and be eligible for watch rewards in your region. Thank you so much, Aved. Yes, and today Group B will be taking to the stage with PSG versus DFM and G2 Esports taking on Loud later in the day. Tomorrow we'll see all four teams in Group A starting off their double elimination bracket. And a reminder that of these teams, only three of them will then progress to the bracket stage, double elimination, best of five brackets. So one of the things I'm very intrigued to find out is exactly how the regions are going to perform. As a reminder, we had those four seeds uh, for pools coming into, which is why I see BLG and G2 on opposite ends of the match. Right, let's dive into some details. Let's turn our attention to our featured matchup. It is, of course, presented by Mercedes-Benz, and it's the LEC's G2 Esports taking on CB LOL's Loud. Uh, EU and Brazil have had a long, long history together. Gut takeaway or gut instinct of this matchup? Yeah, I mean, I just want to go into some of the specifics for Loud first before we do that. They're not just a team. They're a social media phenomenon in Brazil. True. Um, absolutely huge. Um, outside of that, this roster they're sending this time around, it's the most decorated roster that they have ever sent, combined with the players, 15 CP LOL titles. And just outside of that, they only dropped two games in their playoffs So as what well. you're saying is Loud's going to be G2? What no, you're I'm saying just, is Loud's going to be I'm just saying. laying out Rez, facts. Rez, I'm just, just laying out facts here. Just quickly, let's take a look at the, the, the mid lane in particular, Caps versus Tinones. These are two players that really define their respective regions. I mean, look at that. 420 domestic games, 340. Eight domestic sales to four. Nine international appearances to four. Tinones has a history. He's also taken down EU super teams in the past as well. Yeah, but Caps is an MSI champion. <laughs> so it's one of those things where he, can't, he comes into this event having a carry mindset. Of course, there's a little bit of struggle coming into this tournament, but he's been experimenting quite a bit, playing more uh, tanks in the mid lane, facilitating his junglers. So I'm, I'm really interested going into the draft, what he's willing to play. Yeah, and that's the interesting part as well, because for Tin Owen specifically, he's gone on to a facilitating role as well, right? We're looking at the Annies, we're looking at yeah. the Lissandras, we're looking at a guy who's no longer the carry. He's there to make other people shine. Gulborg, this might be a tough question for London to hear, but how did Caps play during uh, playoffs? Oh, you're putting me on the spot, okay. He sucked, okay? There I'm we sorry. go. He did yep. not have a good roster. Will it be this man? Craps? Will it be Claps for final later? That is the second series. Before we get to that, we have a best of three to set up. So let's dive into that first matchup of MSI 2023. The LJL's Detonation Focus, me facing off against the PCS's PSG talent. Now, a brief history lesson from the old man on the desk. These two teams had their peak in 2021. Detonation Focus Me were able to take down C9 in that tiebreaker game at Worlds 21 to advance to the group stage. It sent a shockwave across the League of Legends universe. 
but that was only upstaged by PSG Talent and being able, to, being able to make it to the semi-finals of MSI 2021. 2022, both of these teams struggled a little bit. So during our travel and our flight here, we've been doing a lot of research, a lot of prep. I wanted to task the two analysts on the desk to give me a PowerPoint presentation to catch me up on my history lesson and teach me about these teams. Yeah, you give yourself too much credit. Yeah, that's already true. <laughs> really, we wanted to sugarcoat the information pill just for you. Okay. So okay. here it is, bullet points, simple and easy. The PSG and Detonation Focus Me PowerPoint. Let's get right into it. All right, take the notebook out, Trevor. Yeah, that's the thing. Detonation Focus Me. Whoa. 13 LJL Look title. at those trophies. Absolutely domestic domination. They have been so consistent in being the best Japanese team again and again and again. If you don't know this team just yet, trust me, you will and you should. Next slide, please. Yeah, let's see what we got here. They have been at Worlds since 20, 2018. This is their eighth international performance. Outside of them, as a minor region, they are the team with the most appearances. Once again, again and again and again and again. Now, what is that? Let's see it right there. All right. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. Let's go to the next one. Let's are you getting all of this, clip off. Yes, as you can see, they advanced from play-ins at Worlds 2021. Happy faces all across the board, but did they did not leave all members very happy, as you can see on the next one here. Came at a cost. Oh. It did came at a cost, and it hit us both. It hit us both, very sadly. Yeah. Of course, he went on to do quite well during the tournament, but of course, what, someone had to be sacrificed. Exactly. Go into the next one here. As you can see, this is the new roster because we have new changes coming through, but same old for some of them. As you can see, the first one here. You relate to this one, Trevor. Utapan on the FM since April 2023, this second longest standing member on a team, only outrivaled by Faker with a month and a day. Excuse me and me, the two of us have been side by side at every international yeah, event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next one, next one. That's fine. Next, next. As you can see, we also have Toltu coming in instead of Ebi. Now, Toltu is more like a tank player. He used to be a very interesting guy. He would play Draven top, Action top, the likes of that. Yep. And Ari is back from the LCK. Now, finally, with Detonation Focus Me, where they found the most, um, what do you say, uh, success as well. Then, there's also... Well, who starts the fight for this team? Well, we do have a playmaker, as we can get it right here. Oh! Up, music to our ears, is the playmaking support. And not just that, as we have the last stat come through, they are pretty much first what? in everything. Look at that. Early game domination is what we should expect from Detonation Focus Me. I'm going to hand it over to you now, sir. Thank you, thank you. I think you did a great job of being able to present this to Trevor here. Thank you. I'm you keeping up it. so far. I'm keeping up so far. All right, let's move it on to the next one, and we're going to be talking about PSG. Domestic domination, of course, losing is learning, so they lost twice, but they have been the most dominant team within the region since the era of AHQ and flash rolls and all of that. And as we move on to the next slide... They have a few familiar faces that moved on to the other teams. Like, let's see the, some of the alumni. Gori and River, of course, moving the Golden Guardians. We've seen Dagu and Maple around the world. Juhan, a world champion. May I not have sat in that seat in the finals day. <laughs> still counts. But it still, still counts. counts. Still counts. So we move on to the next slide here, of course. Oh, can you say? Talent Powerhouse! Oh, All right, thank God. Thank so God. lame. I, I didn't make them do pills. that. I said it was sugar-coated. And of course, Junja coming in from EDG, unshackled, mainstay on the PSG roster, and he has a perfect KDA in the finals. He's been amazing, of course, during the regular season, never losing games, and he's just been incredible. Great carry player, hasn't been playing that, more tanks. Wonder if he's gonna be playing that in a tournament. And we move on to the next slide. And Team Fight Ace, wow. this squad, slow, steady, a grind house, but at the end of the day, when it comes to these Drake team fights, will come up clutch. And I'm looking at Waku, a great AD carry that's there to clean up. So have you learned everything here? So far, I think so, I think so. One thing, just one more. Exactly. In conclusion, teams, teams are, are good. good. Okay, right. okay, listen, 90 seconds before we head on stage and meet the teams. I want you guys to give me a prediction because from my takeaway, LJL, Detonate Focus Me, Focus Me have not had much competition in the local region. They smash early. PSG talent, slow, steady, grind it out. This is a clash of styles, who wins and why? Yeah, so I think I have actually set myself 2-1 to destination focus me. Oh. Now, I think that there is high caliber player on PSG, but it comes down to the early game for me. If detonation focus me can keep up the hyper aggression, have Harp on a playmaker, which he was so good at leading off to playoffs as well, I think they have a real chance. My only worry that I have with the FM is that for the longest time with this, not just this roster, but the FM in general, you get to the mid to late game, this team fumbles the ball a little bit and there's some oopsies, but I'm hoping DFM if they come out on their best day. I just think PSG is too talented across the board and we're gonna finally see them tested in an international stage. I have them 2-0. And I'm expecting a lot from this team. 2-0. Okay, final thing here. PSG will be starting on the blue side very quick. Anticipation for the draft. Once you meet the players, we are going to cast. 
Ooh, Ooh. Even though Wukong did get hit, I still think he's a great team fighter. I'm expecting Wukong to be pick. Any quick thoughts? Yeah, I think it's the same, at least of DFM as well. Like, it's just a stylistic. We'll pretty much see the same. Tank top facilitating mid. Yes. Potential carry jungler. Is that where they're, where they're going to differ? And then the bot lanes as a carry. Gentlemen, that was fantastic. I know the teams. I know the predictions. I know the champions. That is it from us here at the Analyst Desk. It is time to kick off the 2023 Mid-Season Invitational from the Copper Box Arena right here in London! From these streets, we will climb to the top once more. Doubt us all you want, Europe is our turn. Eu sei o que significa derrubar a Europa. Cuidado para não dar cabo. They told me my story was over. I'm here to show them I have chapters left to write. Có rất là nhiều gã khổng lồ ở London và mình sẽ hàng gục tức ở các bọn họ. Cuanto más alto, más duro será la caída. I will defy the past. Mình sẽ thách thức tất cả các kỳ vọng. Gien cai o cuba. Tôi sẽ phản bội tất cả những gì tôi đã Eu vou desafiar todas as probabilidades. Vou desafiar os haters. I will defy them all. Usoe. Hello, everybody, and 
Welcome, MSI is finally here. My name is Mudge Balls. I'm joined by Mark C. And on behalf of everyone here in the cough box, welcome to London. Sir. Thank you, thank you. I had a miserable flight over. There was a baby next to me, but even that cannot stop me from being excited with how amazing the stage looks and, and how awesome these teams are. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the stage, I think the best we've seen in, in a lot of years in League of Legends. It looks absolutely sick. Uh, but we're here for PSG versus the FM, and I feel like this is going to be a, a good series to start our MSI off with, just because these are two regions that have been consistently trying to fight against expectations, right? PSG fighting against kind of the old expectations of Flash Wolves, whereas DFM, every year it feels like they're chipping away, they're climbing closer to being a bigger name. Yeah, I mean, DFM making it to the main stage of Worlds was a huge accomplishment yeah. for the region of Japan. There's been a small step down a little bit in the most recent year, but I think this is a team that a lot of people are excited about. They are the uh, de facto bosses of the LJL. Everything kind of runs through them. Uh, and I think stylistically, like you kind of talked about, this is a great matchup between these two teams because they're kind of polar opposites in how they approach the game. Yeah, absolutely. You've got, on the one hand, you've got PSG who are, the, the way to think about this team is their coach is from 2021 EDG. Their jungler was the sub for 2021 EDG. That was a team that played correct League of Legends, slow, steady, clear game plan. And that is exactly what PSG are gonna bring to the table. DFM, they're gonna wanna change things up in the early game. They wanna get, they're gonna wanna get aggressive. All right, we're gonna hot drop in. Bands already done. You can see some Varus LeBlanc uh, Rakan banned out by PSG on the side of DFM, Syndra, Kennen, Lucian. And I just want to mention that Lucian, brother. Right? You think you hate Lucian Nami? You think you're sick of seeing Lucian Nami? They have banned Lucian in every single game they've played since the 18th of February. That's patch 13.1. That's two and a half months ago since this team played against Lucian Nami. And no one hates them more than Udipon, apparently. Uh, otherwise, though, it seems like there's a big question about how the draft might change with the fact that we're on 13.8. Some regions uh, were playing regionally on 13.7, 13.6 for some of them. So there were some changes that came through, but right now, not looking too different. Annie's still very high prio, uh, despite some of the nerfs that came through, small stuff on the shield. Yeah. Same with uh, Vi getting picked up. Jinx feels like the highest prio thing currently for a lot of teams, especially in solo queue, at least it's the highest presence, but it's something that I think a lot of people are going to default to if you're going yeah. a little bit later game. I think Ari as well, a mid laner that we're gonna see a lot across the course of this tournament. It's also a very good pick away from Aria. If yes. anyone saw the, the LJL finals, Aria's mechanics on this champion are immaculate in those team fights. So Yubao, worth mentioning, previously known as Uniboy, so you've seen this guy before, you guys will know him at home, uh, taking that one away from Aria. But the Thresh, very standard to be locked in alongside this Jinx. So far, seems like fairly standard drafting from what we've seen across the course of the year. Yep, no support Annie. That's going to go mid lane, getting rid of that flex pretty much right away to make sure that the Thresh doesn't get banned out because it is one of Jinx's favorite pairings anyways in the lane phase. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to see DFM kind of go this more standard route right now because when you look at these two teams and how they play, PSG, slowest team in terms of bloodiness in the tournament. Their games do go very late. They're often picking up Dragon Souls and stuff like that, focusing more on scaling into the late game. Uh, for DFM, they can be crazy. Some of their games they were taking in the finals, Inhibitor turrets pre-20 minutes. They have this Blitzcrank running around. Harp has a ton of crazy picks. Yeah. And I think uh, for the opening game, the fact that this is no longer best of ones, but best of threes, a huge change in the format. It does give you a potential game to play with to kind of feel out your opponents. Maybe you yeah. start a little more standard. Hey, if we're better than them, we can kind of just keep running this. But if we struggle in game one, that's when all the craziness comes out game two. Yeah, exactly. You've got that little bit of space to kind of innovate in, in a best of series, right? Mm -hmm. Ironically, we've seen the opposite of that. <laughs> the Blitzcrank, take it away. This is a classic answer to the Thresh. We're going to expect to see more and more Blitzcrank and Harp actually playing that in the LJL finals, specifically against the Thresh. Yeah, I think everyone at this point, Blitzcrank's been popping up slightly more and more around the world thus far as a counterpick to the Thresh. There's a lot of hook champions which are becoming more and more meta. Of course, Pike is seen by some people still with their pocket picks, hike, uh, Pikes, as well as even Nautilus in the meta. So no surprise to see the Blitzcrank as the obvious takeaway. And the, the Zin Zhao, a few people might be confused to see a Zin Zhao ban. Um, Steel played that all three games of the LGL Finals. He loves to be aggressive in the jungle, and the Wukong will certainly be the ticket to make that aggression happen. Yeah, third most played in spring for Steel. He's kind of the unsung hero in a lot of ways for DFM. You heard them talking about the history of this organization, kind of Utapon as, as the central figure. Evie was kind of like the PR face of it. I think he's a, a, a face that we're all going to miss, the thumbs up that was kind of the staple for international play to see him always having that bit of personality. Now, of course, moving over to uh, LEC. But 
Um, Steel has actually been there almost as long as Utapon has. He's been there basically since the beginning. Him, Utapon, and Kazu are kind of the, the mainstays now of the DFM squad. Yeah, it feels like Steel's been there forever as well. It's just Utapon's been there even longer than yeah. forever, you know? Like, <laughs> He's the OG OG. Yeah, <laughs> yeah th this pair have been there for a long old time. Uh, but we look like we might have a Cassante as our final lock in for PSG. So that tank top lane, and you anticipate the toll to this guy likes a tank. This guy loves a Malphite. This guy loves a Scion. Yeah, the, the holding of the counter pick here for Toll 2 is definitely not for a crazy counter pick carry to come in. It is to make sure that uh, Aji cannot get a good uh, counter pick against him. The fact that he's more likely to take some of those carry picks. So by saving it for the last pick, you force this kind of tank first tank up in the top side. Maybe not going to be the focus point. It seems like a lot of mid focus with how much setup there is for the jugglers in the mid lane. And I have to say, I'm a little surprised by DFM strap. I anticipated a bit more yeah. aggression. I expected a little bit more like proactivity. Grand if they do have the Annie in the mid lane, so they do have tools uh, to make proactive plays, but anticipate them looking to try and play through pockets and vision and picks. That's typically what we've seen from this team over the course of the year. Yeah, they're definitely a team that likes to get out on the map early. Harp can move around a lot. PSG, uh, a lot of the times, Junja, like you said, is uh, playing more control, making sure the enemy team can't get these big leads, play around his lanes, get vision out, make sure everyone feels safe, scaling into that mid to late game, and especially stacking the dragons will be a big focus for them. Certainly will be. We've kind of got a clash of styles between our two teams to kick off MSI. And I'm hoping that, that DFM will bring that aggression to the early game. The coaches are going to shake hands and walk into the circle of doom. It's so hype looking. <laughs> <laughs> it is a, an absolutely incredible stage. And I have to say, it is very London. They've done a good job of trying to reflect uh, the city there. You see nervous looking faces as they kick off MSI. And I've got to say, I don't envy the players on the stage being the ones to start the entire tournament. I know, first match of MSI 2023, setting the stage for the gameplay, the meta, everything. We'll see what they're gonna be able to pull out here as we head into game one. Here we go, MSI starts now. Live from London, it's PSG, it's DFM going toe to toe. And I'm looking towards this mid lane here. Aria, Yubao. Both of these guys, a reasonable amount of experience under their belts, and they want to be proactive. They want to be initiation tools. They want to start things off for the teams. Absolutely. Uh, Wako, of course, is the late game carry for PSG, but a lot of times the early movements, if anything's going to come through, it's Yubao who's going to be doing that, uh, moving around the map. Same with Arya, a little bit more of a, of a facilitator for the team, but works very well with Steel and Harp. We'll have to see where they try and go for it. For me, I'm very interested in looking at PSG just because I think for a lot of people, they are the dark horse uh, third team to get out of this stage one that's coming in. There's going to be three teams to get out of the eight teams competing right now and move into the main stage. And there's a debate between who's going to get that last spot. I think a lot of people are, are, are pretty safely betting G2 and BLG as favorites to get out. Golden Guardians, PSG, who is it going to be? And I think, uh, like I said, for a lot of people, PSG actually is rated higher than Golden Guardians in their power rankings. And so this is a, a pretty big statement game to go up against one of the best minor region teams in recent years yeah. in, from Japan and, and see if they can actually kind of get a foothold in this tournament. And I think the, to, to kind of extend on that conversation, like when you look at PSG in their domestic finals, it looks amazing. The way that they play, very slow, very correct, precise League of Legends, like their vision control, their, their objective setup, it all looks fantastic. It's all very planned out, but to, to quote a very famous person, uh -oh. everyone has a plan until you're punched in the mouth. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and I feel like DFM are the kind of team that might just come up and punch them in the mouth. This is a team that does like to get a bit chaotic. This is a team that, especially Harp and Steel and Aria, like working in these little combos, get some key chains off, find picks, and then explode the game from there. They're like, stylistically, this could be the matchup where DFM, if they can make things happen, could perhaps upset that Dark Horse right at the very go. Absolutely. The slow, safe, steady scaling game plan that PSG likes to go for is one that, as a North American fan, I've seen time and time again. Oh, hook oh, goes wide. Hook for hook on the bottom side. The Flame Trump's there, but it's level two for DFM. The Flame Trump is going to keep Woody in the play. Harp just whipping away. Even without landing that hook, the level two advantage for DFM, making sure that they still come out ahead on that trade a little bit, getting the shove onto PSG there, but it's going to be just fine for the Nautilus hitting two now. And I feel like so far what we're seeing at this bottom lane, you know, it's Jinx Thresh, but don't anticipate no aggression from Harp. This is a playmaker. They said it on the analyst desk, and I agree completely. Harp, in my mind, is the player to watch on DFM. Absolutely. Uh, he's someone who loves to get out of the lane. Despite Utapon being a huge focus for this team and how they want to play out games, uh, they are more than willing to have Harp do exactly this. Head up the river, ditch bot lane as soon as they have Pryo, start getting vision control for Aria, maybe even make a gank happen here. Yubao, no idea that he's all the way this far up the river. No 
Aria has the stun, has flash available, but do they have the damage to finish off a level four Aria? I'm not so sure. No, I think the fact that they don't have good clear eyes on where Jinja is, as well as the fact that the wave is pushing in, means that you're gonna be fighting into a minion wave, maybe enemy jungler is collapsing. Nice little play there for, uh, you know, Harp to get out of lane while you get this kind of cheater recall out for you to pawn, quickly grab a cull and his uh, Doran's Blade to be able to start focusing on farming up. And Harp, during that time, doesn't really lose anything. It's going to meet back up at the exact time, time, same time as he gets back to lane. Yeah. I do just want to quickly mention this top lane as well, because while it's not the most exciting matchup, oh, there's no. a big OCS difference going on in that top side right now. Uh, Toll 2 having a bit of a struggle. But I'm going to hold that thought, because Steel, moving down to the bottom side, Waco and Woody, up perhaps a little too okay. far. It's a great little hook, and it's a great flame choppers to follow on up. Woody, force of flash, steel moving in as well. It's a great little dredge line. Is it going to be enough though? Woody underneath the tower, and Waco returning that damage. Yeah, not enough to find a kill there. Woody was able to land the Q to get onto the wall and escape, but still burns the flash and ignite from the bot lane there, only costing you to pawn his ghost. So a very nice trade by DFM. Make sure that they're going to have control of this bot lane for a long period of time. The early aggression from DSN, or, uh, DFM excuse me, already throwing a small wrinkle in the plan of PSG. It's going to be much harder to control these dragons now that your bot lane's a little bit on the back foot. Yeah, and that's something that during like domestic play, PSG were absolutely on it with neutral mm -hmm. objectives. Like We're talking about them playing slow. It's not necessarily that they're not proactive, it's that they are controlled. And so when it came to dragons and things, they were all over it. Toll 2 in a bit of trouble up on the top side. Adja. Slightly Ooh. wide on the knockback, but I could see a solo kill written all over that. Yeah, during that time with the pressure in the top side, Junji getting some counter jungling in, is able to steal a little bit away there. Both junglers uh, just scrapping it out. Just, just, just a bit of a punch out in the jungle here, but Steel likes his odds on this one. The mid lane is going to be heading over, but Junja solo on HP. Steel has to use his clone. Junja out, flash for flash with the mid laners. All right, no, no follow-up there already. You can see the fact that Steel had kind of backed off and used his clone backwards and understood the play wasn't going to continue. But Arya going flash for flash in the mid lane just speaks to the aggressive mindset that these guys have and the fact DFM always wants to look for plays. I will say, as the Ari coming up on six here, I feel okay losing my flash, whereas for Annie, that's a huge playmaking tool. If you start roaming around the map, yeah. not having your flash does mean you lose a bit of that instantaneous engage. And especially when you're against a Vi alongside the Ari, right? Like, yeah. Vi is probably the best jungler for punishing a lack of flash on an individual player. So, we to keep our eyes on Aria, playing safe towards that mid lane. I do want to quickly talk about the AD carries as well. You already mentioned Waco kind of being the late game insurance um, for the squad of PSG. I'd say the same is true for Udupon. I just want to mention, like, outside of League of Legends as well, Udupon is an absolute game. We already talked about his longevity. He's only a month and a day behind Faker in the duration he's had on this team. But he's also Radiant and Valorant. He's global elite in CS. He used to be rank one in Overwatch. This guy is the epitome of one of those. You know, at school, there was those guys that were just better than everyone at every game they touched. That's Udupon in a nutshell. He's, this guy games. <laughs> uh, Big time. Definitely going to be relied upon here. And like you said, just the longevity that he's had, doing it with so many different lineups, different teammates, having to kind of adjust his play style. Yeah. There's, it's a kind of a, a dead era for franchise players, it feels like. People are always jumping around. TES, you know, the fact that Knight suddenly swapped off there. It, yeah. does, it does feel like we're in an era where it's, it's hard to find someone who's going to stick on a team long term. So that's why people like Faker, like Udupon, who can stay on teams for extended periods of time. Very impressive. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you mentioned his versatility as well. Like, the guy has played four roles for this team. Like, he's not just been an AD carry this whole time. 2014, he played every role except the mid lane. And he's one of those AD carries that was happy to play the mages back when that was the meta. So definitely a player that you can rely on. All right, let's bump up to the top side again, which you were kind of hitting on, the CS lead that was growing. It's up to 20 CS now. You can see some dirty farming by Aji there between the turrets. And it's something that, uh, with the loss of Evi, was a big question mark. Hold on, as we might have a dive coming to the bot lane. Scout it out. Yeah, Chun's just like, okay, my top laner is proxying in the top side. That means I can hammer this bottom lane. Udupon and Harp send packing as Yubao moves down as well. And Waka with that white gun is going to shred plates. Absolutely going to start stacking up that goal for Waka. And like you said about the control play, the fact that they have vision on the jungle here of uh, the side 
of DFM, because they have that pressure on the top side, they know there's no way they can test this. They move the extra people down. Yubao moves as well, just for that extra bit of insurance. They probably attract the TPs as well. They know there's no TPs to cover this play. And this is like, okay, it's a 0-0 game, but they're making moves on the map yeah. and they're extending their goal lead and especially getting their primary carry fed on the Aphelios. And I feel like that sequence of play right there is a really great case study on like how PSG likes to play. They don't actually go for the dive. They respect what's happening there with the Thresh. They just take the place and they're like, okay, we've got our advantage, we back away. And this is why everyone's so hot. It's, it's like the analyst like favorite kind of play, like, oh, the map movement, it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. They spot the enemy jungler, they move to the weak side to overload it for plays. Oh. And that's why people are so excited about this team is they play good fundamental League of Legends uh, to find ways to get advantages that aren't just about 1v1ing your opponent in lane or yeah. winning some skirmish ar around a neutral objective. But now, starting off, speaking of neutral objectives, that Herald on the top side. Junja still on the play, Woody alongside him. See the movement from the mid laners, the movement from the top laners. The FM have matched everything though. I feel like for now we're kind of a bit of a stalemate, although the knockback on Toll 2 uh, just wants his first solo kill of the tournament, forces the flash out, but ultimate's still available for Toll 2. He's moving into the plate, still with a cyclone onto Junja, follows him over the wall as the rocket flies across no the map. The SG backing away from this one. Rocket. What's straight between the goalposts? <laughs> All right, goal there for Unipon on the other side of the map. We'll see if PSG are going to let this one go. Shelly's still at half health. The rest of PSG collapsing in. Yubao's in a nice flank position here. They're letting nothing go. Absolutely nothing. Yubao in. Toltu misses the ultimate and will be taken down. It's one for one so far. The Junja on the backside. The charm is nice onto Arya. There's now the all out 2v1 on the top side of the play. And I just forced away. But the health bars are so low. Yubao getting the recess, but he can't quite finish the kill onto Arya. No flash from earlier as he looks for a little bit more. And there's a bonus kill on top. Three for one for PSG, able to steal away the Rift Herald as well. DFM using so many of their ultimates pre-fight. PSG back off, they absorb that initial engage and then find the re-engage with all those tools down. Smashing that fight, getting the CS leads, working down both oh, side no. lane turrets at the same time. During that, Utapon was stuck under the turret while Wako just worked down this turret. Look at that. We're 10 minutes in and he's pretty much got all of these plays solo as well. The first two plays we saw earlier on, the rest of the team backed away. Like this is an Aphelios that is getting super snowballed and Junja has that Herald where he can place it wherever he wants on the map. Yeah, we'll take another look at this fight. Like we said, you can already see the anti uh, ultimate burn down there on the top side. We saw the Wukong ult used as well. So even though it initially trades one for one, Yubao still has all his ult charges. Very nice charm there onto Arya. Harp trying to save him, but it pulls him right into Aji, who is already in his ultimate form, dropping a lot of damage down there. Easy chase down on the tail end of this fight. Arya, maybe if he had his stun up here, could have survived, didn't have it. Potion ticking was not enough to keep him alive. There's the Herald. Eye down, but it was actually picked up, I believe, by Jinji. Yeah, he does Jinji, have it. Yeah, Jinji does have it, so. He must have picked it up after the play. We can see items starting to come in as well. That Gale Force already picked up. The Cole finished off for Wako. But Junja already having the Black Cleaver. 2 0 1 on the buy. And, you know, a lot of the time people talk about, you know, the AD carry didn't get the kill, the mid laner didn't get the kill. But Vi is one of these champions that you're happy to have a couple of early kills on. It's like, am I building Radiant Virtue or am I going to build damage first? And the fact you get these early kills, you're like, all right, let's go the Black Cleaver build. Let's, yeah. let's get this thing going. We have a little bit of a sneaky play, though. Coming out from DFM. Heading away in this brush. Harp's gonna show up. Unicorn's gonna show up. Oh, still. Canceling the recall. Wako could be in trouble. Has his summoners, so does Woody. Ultimate back available for Steel. He feels tense, but I don't feel like they're gonna pull the trigger. I just don't think they have enough vision to, to feel confident going for that play. The fact that they could have had Junjia back there in the back pocket. He was in the river temporarily, but you can see that there's no vision down for DFM actually. So they're kind of brute forcing this play blind. The fact that the Rift Herald was just used mid is a bit of a tell that, hey, Junjia is not waiting in lane at least with these guys. But already PSG has dipped out of there, moved into river and started grabbing the dragon during this Rift Herald charge. You know, charm that. Found the mid lane. But once again, the textbook, right? Drop Herald mid. Not only are you getting plates and, and the presence there, but it gives you priority to then move over and take your first strike. I will say, that is a very slow first strike for what you expect out of PSG domestic. I think they would have liked to grab the first one a little bit faster. That early uh, flash that was burned yeah. of Woody, allowing them to back off and temporarily wait until they get into a powerful position again. It's another thing, while we continue to list the things that PSG does well, <laughs> is absorb pressure. The fact that they did have this temporary disadvantage in the bot lane, and you know, just a couple minutes later, they're the ones almost forcing down this turret without any Herald usage. Right here, Wako's gonna be able to finish that one off in a second. And the gold lead continues to grow. He's already 1,600 gold ahead of Unipom with this turret dropping now. He's over 2,000 gold up on his opponent.
That's not bad, is it? It's not bad. <laughs> I least. feel pretty it's good about that minutes. in my 80 carries up that far, yeah. Considering he's 0 0 0, how often do you see that kind of lead in an essentially neutral lane? That is kind of something absurd from Wako. Just finished his boots as well. There's a BF sword there. He is ready to fight. And I feel like PSG. The, the, the way that we've seen them play is, like, like we said, this slow methodical style, and then they get towards the team fights once they've got their items. DFM, they're a team that can get a little bit impatient. They're a team mm. that when the game is slow like this, we've seen Harp go for plays. We've seen Harp be quite often the initiation tool alongside Steel as like almost dive buddies. On the Thresh, I don't know if he can really be that tool for the team. It's definitely a little harder to just decide to go in at that point. You have to land the hook and get all this nice setup. I will say also about just mentality, the fact that they had that bush stack there. I yeah. feel like domestically, DFM doesn't care if the enemy jungle is there, and they're going to try and go for that yeah. play anyways. Here on the international stage, maybe feeling a little bit more gun shy in the first game, uh, maybe nerve teams them just a little bit, because right now PSG are rolling over them a little bit. Uh, speaking of how good Wako is with gold, Molecule on, on Twitter has these kind of like infographics that he does, yeah. and there's a, one that shows uh, uh, damage per minute with gold, basically, uh, damage share, with also gold percent for your team. and. On that graphic, Wako is way up into the right in terms of getting way more damage done with his gold. So if there's someone you want this farmed on the team, it's absolutely him. Yeah, I mean, I want to go back to the point I made about, you know, Junja, Corgi, the, the coach for the team, both of them previously on that EDG roster. And the way I see PSG right now is like Diet 2021 EDG. Like that, that same style of like they want to play through strong lanes. And they want to apparently dive in the top Ooh. side as well as a hook from Woody. It's knockups galore and it's damage coming out from you, Bao. Absolutely immaculate stuff. Great play by PSG there, breaking the mid turret open and during that time moving up to the top side. You can just see absolutely beautiful vision control for them here in this side of the map. They have that little section cordoned off there. Hold on, got a fight going. Wako has the <laughs> oh, damage. No. They thought they had the weak side. They thought they had the play, but Wako just annihilates them. Finds that kill without burning any sums there. Wako making DFM look silly as he gets a first kill on the board for him there. And the top turret going to drop as well. It's the fact that he just didn't retreat. He was just like, oh, you guys want to fight? OK. Just dodges the skill shots and just blasts his damage out. Harp just taken out of the picture entirely. And I mean, well, it's a 5,000 gold lead for PSG. Just everything that could be going well for PSG is going well for PSG. Yeah, you got to feel feeling good. Anyone who is predicting uh, Dark Horse PSG, this is a very <laughs> validating first game. The fact that they are so in the lead. And here you see the dangers of trying to make a play against White Gun Ophelios. Drops the turret down there, starts stacking the chakram, eats some turret damage as well. Very clean combo there. Gets that last auto attack with range from the green gun. Chakram's come flying in. Boom. That's, uh, that's beautiful stuff coming out from him. No celebration. He's a cold, <laughs> cold that, face killer. Yeah, that is cool. Come collected right there. Ice in the veins for Wako. As now another Herald will be taken by PSG and they continue this snowball rolling. And I mean, what more could you ask? And I think for, for a lot of PCS fans watching today, like there's expectation on this team because they have completely rebuilt from, pre from the previous year. And while we have some returning faces that have been with the organization and have been in PCS for some time, like, this has not been the PSG roster ever before. So while you know PSG as an organization, you don't know it with this set of players. So there is a lot to, to work towards to show that they can live up to the expectation of the organization. Yeah, I think people are used to seeing the name Hanabi right there in the top lane instead yeah, of exactly. Aji. But the fact that he's come in and done such a good job, uh, Wako and, you know, Yuba having some international experience before Junji as well, like you talked about. It's not like it's, it's a team full of rookies, but it's the first time this collection of guys has been on PSG. The fact that they had to rebuild after missing Worlds last year, pretty disappointing for them, I believe. And so this team has uh, had a very, very clean postseason, making it all the way here, kind of reestablishing PCS as the de facto team to fear in these kinds of play in tournaments. I mean, that's that's the goal today, right? That's absolutely the goal for PSG. Aria, though, stepping forwards, and you can see DFM just fully grouped up. They've got a Malphite. They can still make plays. It's Junja goes over the wall, but flashes the ultimate from Toltu. The reactions are too good from Junja. And that's DFM's engaged, basically down the drain. Yeah, not much left here. I mean, I, Annie will still have alt flash available. We'll see if they can find an easy pickoff, but such good vision control by PSG here. So knock up onto Steel. The damage forcing him away once again. Remember, we're fighting over the Drake here. It's a Hextech Drake on the rift. PSG not moving over to get the Drake just yet. They want this fight. Yubao goes forwards. Knocked up by the Cyclone as well, though. 
PSG now with control can move back down to the bottom. Yeah, side. they just completely shove them out of the mid lane there. Get the ultimate out of steel defensively to make sure that they cannot get jumped on top of. But during that time period, it means that now PSG have complete control. DFM are going to back off. Gold lead's going to continue to grow. Dragon's going to go in their back pocket. Each fight just gets more and more difficult to win from here. I just want to point something out that you never see in pro play. Yubao has a zero stack Magi's without dying. He has bought that Magi's without having any Dark Seal stacks. Like almost always you see it bought on like eight or 10 stacks on the Dark Seal. That is bold. He knows he's gonna do well. Playing with confidence, <laughs> you yeah. could say. Uh, as well as the fact that a lot of the times the games are a little bit bloodier when you start going for these. You're smashing a little bit more in terms of kills. While it is a very dominant gold lead for PSG, it has not come off the back of kills. So not as many opportunities to stack uh, the Dark Seal as you might initially before picking up Mage Eyes. Yeah, but confident to go for it. So we're keeping our eyes on him. And remember, this is Uniboy. So you've, you've seen him previously. Had a little stint in the LPL. Uh, at the same time as Junjia was back on EDG, but now both of them joined forces on PSG. And it's good to see this team like feeling confident on the stage. It's good to see them playing the same way that we saw them playing domestically, you know, still sticking to that game. Yeah, absolutely. That one of the things they do very well is pick a side of the map that they want to control. It was one of the things I was trying to highlight before we saw the, the Waco uh, 1v1 onto Harp there. But uh, they decide that, hey, this is the top lane that we want to put most of our resources in. Aji's down the bot side. He doesn't need as many wards set up usually. And then they fight Contest Vision slowly. They have a lot of patience in how they do it. It's not instantly engaging on someone next to the ward. You can see Junjia there charging the Vault Breaker up, ready to go in, threatening it, buying space to try and contest this pink ward, and really taking their time to get this vision control while getting the shove in the top side. Now that you've has that, he can move into the jungle and help them actually secure this vision. It's such a textbook way of playing League of Legends. Yeah. Harold comes down on the top side. That was about to time out, so Junja pretty much just has to slam that at this point. I don't think he'll quite finish the tower off. Hunter might not be able to get a charge as he's hooked under. But there we go. No, he will be able to get his charge off in the end. And oh! <laughs> that's going to be one HP on the tower. But in the meantime, PSG pressuring in the mid lane simultaneously, looking for these objectives. A couple more autos do the trick, but respecting Toll 2's engage, respecting the rotation from DFM. See if there's a bit of a chase down here for DFM if they're actually going to go for the engage. All five are grouped up. Toll 2 does have his ultimate back available. We'll see if he decides to pull the trigger, but doesn't look like they're going to go for it. And speaking of patience, how many people in solo queue greed for that turret and die? How many pro players do? Oh! Or greed for this vision and die, it's Junja. Caught out. A great little pick for DFM, but now Yubao wants to go for the fight anyway. Gets the charm onto Harp. There's a crescendo onto the backside as well. But in the meantime, the rest of the fight is going the way of DFM. Woody trying to escape. Wako up in the river as well as Woody. Just walk away with his life. Yudapon can't quite finish that one off. But it's a great little series of picks coming out for DFM, and now an opportunity. Yeah, two picks, able to grab some objective bounties here as well. Drop this mid lane turret. Right as we were talking about the control for PSG, Junjia gets blown up, split away from the team as well, which is what allowed the second kill to happen as PSG kind of rushed in there to save him or pick a fight that they might be able to win. Fortunately, not able to go for Baron. It did spawn right before that fight took place, but DFM not feeling confident enough to actually force that one down 3v5. I mean, this just felt a little overconfident from Junja. He obviously thought that there was no vision in the area, but I mean, he was sorely mistaken. <laughs> yeah, and I respect uh, the commitment by DFM to blow everything on finishing off here. And then you see this split fight where Steel actually did a really good job refocusing down into Aji, comboing with Yudapon to keep him locked in place, the Kasante not able to get out there, while Wako and Yubao, the two people who actually deal damage, are not next to this part of the fight that's going down. So it was a very nice split fight by DFM there. A little bit of gold back in their pocket now, down to about a 4,000 gold lead, still on the back foot, but shows some of the playmaking that this team has. Yeah. Give them an opportunity, they will absolutely run away with it. So I would describe them as a momentum-based team, right? Like when they start to get going, when they can control vision, they will find picks and they will uh, take over. And once again, Harp the one finding that hook, finding that opportunity for his team. Buying himself a little bit of breathing room, but this is what we were talking about with PSG's objective setup, right? Complete darkness around the Baron. And they're not just going to start that. They're not going to 50-50 that. They they will make sure it's complete darkness. That, that's what I was going to say. The one thing about when you play so slow and you don't like forcing 5v5s, it's like on one end of the spectrum is T1. You know, they, they will start any Baron, no matter who's left alive, the vision control, that they'll, they'll start a Baron if they feel like it. PSG on the far side is even if they have vision control, if they feel like DFM might face check, they're not the most aggressive team about starting it. And there we go, the Quasin Ultimate out, Toll 2. It oh, it's a great little hook though from Harp! 
It's a crescendo of clappage as he finds himself that hook and steel follows up for a little bit more. Adja hooked again. Harp is on a roll right now. It's a power cord coming He's out. Is Junja trying to escape? Adja somehow gets away with his life though, and now DFM could be in trouble because Wako free firing and it's Yubao on the top side of the play. Steel trying to escape with Arya, but Yubao wants to chase them down. The charm is there. A double for Wako. Absolute miracle turnaround there. The fact that Asha is able to get out alive somehow buys time for the rest of PSG to collapse. Four for one on the tail end of that fight, and Baron gonna go in their pockets. Ah, uh, the hooks look so good from Harp, but unfortunately, the, the greater situation, not the same. And now PSG, they get that objective that they've been posturing. I thought for sure DFM was about to win that fight. Maybe yeah. themselves set up for a Baron on the tail end of it, but. Just not enough damage to finish out Aja there, who somehow was able to survive. Fought yeah. enough time for, for the rest of PSG to collapse. Great bit of playmaking there from you, Bob, as well, on the yeah. backside of the fight. Like, to threaten the back line to the point where there wasn't enough follow -up. So exactly what I was saying, they'll, they'll almost never start the Baron. They're going to be in these near bushes, camping, trying to find picks. The fact that they get this one on Woody with a nice hook by Harp there, looks like a great uh, pick off there. The ult from Cole 2 getting flashed out again. But here, the second hook onto Aja is when I'm like, okay, this is looking great. They blow all their spells to finish him off. But you can see the kind of disruption that comes through. Junja and Yubao on those sides, flying in, stopping the damage from being able to continue through onto Aja and actually finish him out. There's the stopwatch forced by Arya. The fact that they're able to blow up Unipod. Yeah. No time to talk about it, though. Woody goes into the back side of the pit, gets a hook on Steel Toll 2, trying to buy space for his team 4k on the Dragon as it resets. Woody might have to get back out of the play here. Toll 2, only a knock-up on to Juncha. Steel 1 HP, take it down Juncha on the back side of the play, and the follow-up is there from Aja. Pulls him over the wall and takes them down. You bow with a double, and PSG, this is full fat fighting. A five for zero PSG quadra kill coming in there for you, Bao. They have minions in the mid lane. This might be game if they choose to try and push down through there. Instead, working bot lane. Absolutely monstrous fight out of PSG again. And I just want to say, 22 stacks now. Instantly. Bought the Medjai's <laughs> with confidence, and he had the play to follow it up. 14 to four. And, and what a debut game here on the stage for this brand new PSG squad. Absolutely crushing game one here. A couple of small pickoffs DFM was able to pull off, but aside from those, it has been dominance out of the side of PSG. The objective control, three turret or three dragons down, excuse me, both Rift Herald, the Baron in their pockets. This is what has made them such a fearsome team now. They are slow though, they did not go for the killer end that I think some LPL teams might have after winning a fight like that. They go all rush mid, uh, instead they're gonna go take this base, use all this gold that they just got and, and really make sure this game's in their hands. Have a moment to take another look at this team fight. Junja died in the backside alongside you. Yeah, I gotta say, for, for Tolt 2, just really struggling to find targets for his ultimate here. He just kind of drops it onto uh, the jungler for Junja there. Yubao did ult away, but he's just never really focused the backline down. And of course, very easy for PSG to take this front to back team fight after uh, they're so far ahead in gold and there's no threat on their actual backline. They just melt through DFM one after another. I mean, this, they can have a hell of a deal with Waco in these fights. Like, when. When your your Malphite doesn't find that great of an ultimate, you don't. You're the ones on the back foot. You're the ones counting away. But Aphelios is just chilling. We already talked about his absurd gold lead like hours ago in this game. It's only skyrocketed since then. Yeah, you need some sort of insane combination of the Annie, Wukong, and Malphite. But if you don't land that, he's just going to clean up from the backside. Also, did the BT second build to make sure he has those extra defenses uh, with the overheal, of course, to make sure that he is a very tanky Aphelios. He's basically a full item up. Unipon at this point. And we, I mean, we always talk about like the three item mark for Great Eddie Carries. Juncture caught again here, does get stunned, but I mean, don't even break his shield. No, very hard right now for DFM Puncher. We'll see if they can hold on. Super Creeps flooding into the mid lane, escorted by Yubao while the rest of them work on the top side. Saving Grace is that the Baron buff did time out for PSG, so not yeah. empowered minions. Feel like a situation where PSG is just kind of going to use this pressure to smother DFM, keep them locked in their base for the next couple of minutes. If DFM pick a fight, They'll take it, of course, but otherwise. <laughs> Woody's just, uh, sir. Does he know? Does he know? <laughs> does he know? <laughs> um, I, I do want to take this moment, unless we see a dive coming on through. Which is definitely possible. Still, it's clone knock back here. I don't think PSG can really commit to this one right now. We'll have to back away. We get to celebrate the fact that this is double a limb and this is best of three.
Like, DFM, even if they end up losing this game, they get another stab at this. I would love to see a little bit more proactivity in their draft. I would love to see a bit more. Where's the Xin Zhao that we saw in their final? Munchable's already moving on to game two. Done, <laughs> done with game one, huh? Uh, it's definitely the case where it does feel like, pretty doomed. I can recognize the game state, okay? With 12k up in 27 <laughs> minutes, I'm not going to sugarcoat it at this point. No, they're coming back right now. TP playing from Toltu. Here we go. Wako Court, we said, how can they catch the Abelios? That is how the Cyclone Dev Steel is going to trade his life for it. Junja does find the answer. And now they're on the wrong side of the play. Junja turns golden as Aja tries to protect his jungler. Looking for Unipon and his AD carries down on both sides. Are he the next target? But a great little lantern from half. But it's not enough. With Toltu falling, PSG once again find their fight. We've been hyping up Wako, but there are other threats for PSG available. Aji and Yubao clean that fight up from the backside, able to find multiple kills. He TPs into the mid lane, trying to end the game right now. TP coming in for Yubao as well, healing up in the fountain first. It's a bit aggressive from Aja. It might be in trouble here. One more tower shot, but he walks away. That's some swagger in the top lane coming out from PSG, who look fantastic today. They woke up on the right side of the bed. They're not going to win. <laughs> They're going to And Look, we said they play safe. That's as safe as it comes. I mean, I was even, to be honest, I was surprised they TP'd mid. I, I thought for sure that was a take the top turret inhibitor, get your second inhib, start working down the neutral objectives as they start spawning. Uh, I was very happy to see PSG try to end the game there, but a little too risky for them. Ends up backing off as Udipon was within 10 seconds of spawning. I can understand the concern about the Jinx resets as Baron maybe spawns shortly after. Uh, this is exactly what we were talking about. You have to get on top of Wako. Somehow the TP flank by Toltu, the ward in lane, sets this up. Arya also comboing in range. Range to get a Q stun off, did not land the ultimate initially, as uh, you saw Woody there trying to interrupt that, but Steel got on top of him, everyone was able to get on top of him, but it does leave your backside pretty exposed, Harp is trying to run through Aja and Yubao effectively, so even though they finish off that initial kill very cleanly onto Wako, Yudapon is now, like you said, on the wrong side of the fight, and allows the rest of the team to kind of just flash on top of him, you can see the solo lane Bash Brothers of PSG. Yeah, when that all out hits an AD carry, you just know that there's nothing. Uh, Kasate, one of those champions that is real oppressive in the 1v1. Uh, but now Baron just kicks straight off for PSG. They know that they have control. Junja kind of playing bodyguard, playing bouncer in that jungle. Is DFM perhaps baited by the fact that it's been so slow previously? Not going to check it just yet. Still trying to finally move on forwards with PSG. Kiting away from this one. Junja behind enemy lines. He wants Udipon here. All five All players are here, but look at that. You bow on the play with him. And it is just immaculate. Once again, PSG looking fantastic in these fights. Absolutely clinical fight there by PSG, finding the back line of Udupon, instantly assassinating him. Yubao and Aji in the most two recent fights being absolutely huge. And this is what makes PSG such a threatening team here in stage one of bracket play. Multiple threats available for their team. Very clean early game and then an explosive mid to late game team fighting team. Yeah, fantastic stuff. And the PCS kind of showing up here. Game number one, playing their game and playing it damn well. 23 to 5 to finish. And I think PSG making a statement here saying, hey, we're here to play. First game of MSI showing up, absolutely destroying their competition and saying this is a team that you got to keep your eyes on as we move throughout this tournament. Though we might be getting ahead of ourselves, remember, bracket play, like it's we said, three. it's a best of three. DFM are going to have time to go back, head to their, their uh, cooldown room, be able to retro that game and figure out in draft if there's new things that they want to throw up at the side of PSG. Yeah, we'll have to see what DFM can do for game number two. And I'm excited for that because I don't feel like the draft was necessarily that DFM. You know, I, I yeah. expected like a Rakan coming out from half. I expected, I mean, the blitz strength was bad because they already had the fresh, but like those those really hard engaged tools, typically what we've seen. And, and like the Zin Zhao in the jungle, I'd love to see some of that kind of patented playmaking and, and pick potential that, that we've seen so often from them. And I like when they play aggressive. We talked about that play yeah. in the bot side where like maybe it would have been risky to go for it, but like traditional DFM goes for it anyways. And I felt like they were starting to do that a little bit later on in the game. You saw them going for those more aggressive in uh, TPs from behind and stuff like that. Yeah. Once the game got away from them, just do that a little bit earlier. I really love that level of aggression from yeah. DFM. And at the end of the day, you got to remember, this is game number one of the entire tournament. There's going to be a little bit of jitters on that stage. So hopefully DFM can uh, bring things back for game number two. I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see what PSG have up their sleeves as well. We're going to kick it over to Quick Shot, Raz and Gulborg to break that one down.
Thank you so much, gentlemen. I am hopeful that DFN can bring you back, but I'm not optimistic. Now, we'll get to some of the numbers in just a little bit. Gentlemen, let's start with the draft. I think um, not a huge amount of surprises. I asked the production team just to put the two compositions together because I think they were quite stylistic. I think in particular, DFM, look at the Malfa, look at the Annie. Go in, go hard, go fast. That's kind of been their motto to victory. Yeah, so that's the thing as well. So, still getting that Wukong on four as well. That was his first most played champion. Annie was the most played champion from Aria 2. Thresh, second in most plays yeah. as well from Harm. Yeah. Pretty much everything just here made sane. The big question Mike I had was that I initially thought that as soon as they saw the Vive first pick, they are going to go Sire instead because that's also one of Utapon's most played champion and after seeing all those R buttons on him, maybe wish he played that later down the line, but yeah, they're pre pretty much a spot on for a DFM. It's tough, especially with the pace of this game, I actually quite like DFM's comp. I think, especially with the Thresh Jinx, keeping, uh, uh, you can kite back a little bit more easier versus the composition of PSG. Uh, it's a lot more easier to play patiently, uh, especially with the game being a lot more scaling based. You don't need to fight for First Herald as an example. So there are things like that that I did appreciate from DFM side, but then it was just more of the team fights were just not working in terms of like mechanics. They were, they were messing up in I mean, I, it's so crucial because by the time we do get to the first replay, which will in a moment, the moment this played out, you just knew PSG were going to win. Like yeah. the, the uh, stacks were like in their favor. I think in particular the fact that Ariel wasn't able to have an impact on that Ari at all. Let's take a look at this Rift Herald fight. It ultimately is defined by some misplays, and I think PSG, they controlled and contained DFM. Yeah, first things first for me, I like the Aja's mindset. He had Annie ulti on top of him, so he was charging up Q. He then isolates the Thresh. Bad idea to take the Thresh Lantern, I will say. It isolates him, so Jinx is actually gets get, uh, getting soloed, or at least it was Yubao. So Yubao is getting soloed there, and it makes it really awkward for them, and it gets an, uh, an angle for resets for Ari. Yeah, I think the biggest one was just the fact that they stuck around for too long. Yes. Initially in that play, it was great. They scared PSG away from the Herald, but then they stayed themselves, and they had a composition where you could turn. The problem is, you're turning on enemy soup, right? So there's still damage dealers that's gonna chase you down and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, and a small thing. I think patience there for the Malphite was really important because he was aiming for a two-man ulti, ended up missing the Ari on that one. I think you just wait for them to come in a little closer, yeah. you can get a better target. Uh, so I like the angles that PSG was taking. They're just a lot more, I think, a lot more refined in team fights. One of the questions I'm gonna ask you when we take a look at some of these stats is, did Detonation focus me fumble? and not live up to their early game dominance that we've seen from the LGL, or did PSG outplay them? While you think about that, I want to put this into some screens. Now, I haven't seen the specific numbers, but if I can take a look at DFTM's early game stats from the LJL, where they were so incredibly dominant and frankly unchallenged, two and a half thousand gold averagely to 14. 4.9 kills to one this game. Three deaths to three, so obviously died the same, but I think crucially, not giving those kills, not giving those towers, not giving those heralds, it was a incredibly dominant early game, which did not translate to their first match yet today. It's a classic case of better competition internationally. This is the same thing for PSG and uh, Detonation Focus Me. For Obviously, sure. in domestically, there's not going to be a lot of challenge. You go up against international opponents, and I just think PSG played the map a lot better, uh, flatly. Uh, another good example would be the fact that we saw that Wako had solo time, got uh, two turret plates bot side, just because he had Ari moving towards him. So there are a few things that I felt like PSG playing the map a little bit better, a little smarter. Yeah, and I think in general as well, for Detonation Focus Me, one of their main win conditions had been, let's get Ari around the map as well, when they're pl specifically playing the Annie. Yeah. He was out-rotated on that multiple times, leading into your point as well. PSG played the early game better when they had the rotation. But I also think that DFM was a bit scattered on the map in terms of the shot calling as well, in terms of what they wanted. On that initial butt dive, Steel is up towards the top side, yeah. not there covering. They didn't dive. It could have been a dive for some yeah. other teams, and you die there. Then there's in the mid game where top lane is dying, and no one's out on the map. But top wrong, two wrong is still side up of the there. map. Now the question is, question is, can you can you make an inference on like what could cause that? Is it bad calling? Is it being outplayed? Is it an individual mistake? Because that is something that is fixable. I use the term loosely, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, but we said multiple times, like where is steel? I mean, I'll tell you what, some of it is steel in terms of where being on the right side of the map, but in the end, that's just planning with, with your team and, yeah. and team fight composition in general, like that. Him going up to top lane, dying after the dive. Well, you know, that, that shouldn't happen, but still, it's about sending it. You had the first game, maybe stage jettis. I think just being on the same page is way more important here for you. Yeah, you should recognize the stages of looking for a dive top lane, yeah, right? They're exactly. clearing top lane vision towards like a uh, red side jungle. You're like, okay, they're trying to set this up. But the instance that you see Utapon in base, steal on Grump, it should be blaring alarms for Toll 2 that is like, I should leave 
we have no response on the opposite side of the map. It's let an illusion. That turret didn't it's exist. It was already illusion. down. Yeah. <laughs> okay, listen, let me move us along. We want to celebrate one more play here from a PSG because every second counts, and thanks to the reliable Cisco Netrek, Archie escapes the 22-minute team fight with a sliver of HP, which allowed PSG to turn their fight. And now this fight is pretty much the fight that would make or break the game for the event because they had struggled to stay in it. And initially, it looks so good for them. They get the first pickup, but this is where it gets so beautiful in the way that PSG navigates the team fight. Yeah, in comes the response. You about coming from a flank. I just feel like this has been happening in multiple team fights for them. And you also see an instant cleanse uh, from Wako to just clean them up. So I, I really like this from PSG. They did make a few too many mistakes. There was one where they were uh, Junjia that was walking up to Vision and the enemy red side jungle yeah. gets picked off and they take a split fight. So there are moments where we're seeing DFM starting to come back into games. It's a little bit messy, but still much cleaner than PSG. That is hopium if That's ever. the only thing I got. <laughs> If ever I've heard it, That's Raz. the only thing so, I got. Can I also just say, GP just for golds, when you look backstage, not only is this stage sick. That is also, awesome. It could be Berlin, just for the record, because this is exactly what every <laughs> building because in Berlin it looks, looks like. like. A <laughs> Anyways, GP, let's remind everyone, this is a best of three. Detonation Focus Media, they've chosen a blue side. What adjustments do you want to see going into game two? My eyes are going to be on steel. And I also want to see, like, there was multiple attempts to ganks in that bottom lane, which didn't pay off this time around. DFM, they cannot afford to get, you know, steamrolled again in that early yeah, game. Yeah, I think if they're going for the same draft with that, stylistic we just saw it's just to play itself right there wasn't inherently too much wrong with it it's more how it was played i think if you have any drafting points and you want to change it up for a yeah. curveball in there you get aria and one of his assassins uh, and then you just make him uh, run the game exactly draft is just a band-aid and quite honestly they need one and i think early game could just be a big boost towards what dfm has what harp was looking for multiple times in this game the early hook bot side i think was working great for them he looked mid at one moment couldn't find an angle. I think if you play towards harp strength, you get something great. We're gonna have to find out if they can. Reminder to everybody watching at home, if Detonation Focus B lose this, they will have one more best of three to play. We'll be back with game two between PSG Talon and DFM after the break. Do not go anywhere. Absolutely beautiful vision control for them here in this side of the map. They have that little section cordoned off there. Hold on, got a fight going. Wako has the <laughs> oh, damage! No. They thought they had the weak side, they thought they had the play, but Wako just annihilates them. How many people in solo queue greed for that turret and die? How many pro players? Do oh! Or greed for this vision and die, it's Junja. Hooked again! Harp is on a roll right now, it's a power cord coming He's on. He's out! It Junja trying to escape. That just somehow gets away with his life though, and now DFM could be in trouble, because Wako free firing, and it's Yubao on the top side of the play, still trying to escape with Arya, but Yubao wants to chase them down! The charm is there! A double for Wako! A team against a king. Seeing against believing. A moment against a moment for the ages. Countless battles, one arena, the realm. The only thing capable of powering the game, the stage, the broadcast, and the worldwide spectacle we know and love, AKA the Cisco Network. New and existing customers can choose the phone they want, like the incredible iPhone 14 on us. Not to brag, but I'm on Verizon now. And I got to choose the phone I wanted for free. Not that you're bragging. Choose the phone you want on us. Verizon.